The good thing about playing bass, and, and I'm talking particularly about bass guitar, is, and this isn't being derogatory to, to us and our instrument, but the truth of it is, I think compared to every other instrument, it's probably the easiest one to, to learn to play reasonably quickly and, and, re and reasonably well. Hi, and welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. If you've ever wanted to learn bass, you should know that right now there are thousands of people inside the For Bass Players Only community, a lot of them over 50, who are learning bass and having the time of their life playing the music that they love. Come join them and experience that incredible transformation for yourself, because you're never too old to groove. So let's play bass. My guest this week is an old friend, Dave Swift, who is originally from Wolverhampton, England. I hope I pronounced that right. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave is an outstanding doubler, both electric and uh, bright bass. He became a bass player after stints with guitar and trombone. I think he might be he's kind of getting back into the brass world a little bit. Maybe we could talk about that. Since the early 90s, Dave has been holding down the bass chair in Later with Jules Hollins, a longtime British-based TV show hosted by former Squeeze keyboardist Jules Holland. In addition to the endless list of musical icons he's accompanied on the show, Smokey Robinson, Eric Clapton, people at that level, Dave has performed at many of the major jazz festivals around the world, as well as on a whole bunch of film soundtracks and commercials. He's also accompanied the likes of Rick Astley, Gary U.S. Bonds, Ben E. King, and former Kinks frontman Ray Davies. And he's just completed a brand new album with Sir Rod Stewart. This is his second time on For Bass Players Only. Welcome, Dave. Great to have you back. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. The last interview we did was at the London Bass Guitar Show, and that was in 2016. So... Anything new? <laughs> oh, a few a few bits and pieces that I've been involved with. <laughs> well, I do want to talk about the Rod Stewart album, and maybe we can work up to that if there are any other highlights <clears throat> or uh, things that stand out between 2016 and now. You know, jump sure, in. Sure. There. What's been going on that's noteworthy? Well, I mean, the, the good thing is that, you know, throughout, obviously, lockdown was a big... Uh, it was a big change for all of us, you know, that whole sort of COVID time. <clears throat> but the uh, the good thing, um, I, I was actually in in a uh, living with a, a band. We were a, uh, not not the Jules band; it was a different band at the time. And we were living in a big country house in Norfolk. And we were and we were uh, rehearsing and recording. We actually recorded a single with Robbie Williams while he was in California, and we were in Norfolk. And we 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 did a single with him remotely. But we were like. It was like a commune type thing, you know, and my wife and my son were there and and we were living, recording, rehearsing as a band and it was quite good fun. So actually 2020 was n nothing slowed down there, you know, for <clears throat> for me. But the good news was the Jules' TV show, the regular Later with Jules ha had to stop. But on his New Year's Eve TV show, which is called Jules Holland's Hootenanny, uh, which is, we are the house band on that, and we have to back a whole a plethora of artists on there. And the BBC insisted that that show went ahead. So that that show, Later with Jules Holland, began in 92, the year after I got the Jules gig, and the, the Hoot and Annie New Year's Eve show began in 93. So the, the great thing is that show has never stopped. So even in 2020, we still recorded the, the Hoot and Annie. But it was unusual because we didn't have an audience. Uh, you know, it was just us there. We all had to wear masks and we had no audience. And, the, and we're playing with people like, you know, Tom Jones and all these iconic people. And we're looking out and all there is is one cameraman and, and someone with like a clipboard and, and one of the cleaners, I think, was there. <laughs> so when we're recording the show, because it is pre-recorded, it always has been, you know, and we record, and we finished this big number with Tom Jones. And normally the audience would go crazy. And all we could hear was like the one cameraman and the cleaner kind of going <laughs> in the background, you know. I'm pleased to say that they added uh, an applause track uh, on the end of it later on. That's so that's cheating. 
Yeah, I know, I know, but we had to do something. But um, but yeah, you know, the, 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 I still do two tours with Jules every year. We do a big summer tour, we do a big winter tour. There's obviously the regular later TV show, uh, the the radio show. But and we we you know we we try and do an album each year with Jules, and it's usually sometimes we'll do one just as the Jules Holland band, but more often than not we'll have a guest artist come in and we'll do a whole album with them. So we did one with Mark Ullman, we did one with Tom Jones, things like that. Um, and then what happened is a few years ago, Rod Stewart, who and, and Rod and Jules, they knew of each other, but they, you know, they they weren't big pals at the time. Although ironically, they're both crazy about model uh, railway uh, trains. You know, that's their big passion. You know, so Rod contacted Jules and said, "Listen, I want to do a big band album. I've done something similar before, right. but when he did it before, he'd used." Um, you know, sort of session musicians that were not necessarily a band. You know, they were just all individual players. You know Conrad uh, Korsh? Say again, sorry? You know Conrad Korsh? I know the name. Yeah, he he got into Rod's world by playing on a, a something different, sort of like similar to what you're describing. It was like a okay. big jazz thing, and he played upright on it, and he morphed into becoming his bass player for uh, quite well, a Oh, fantastic. Yeah, because my, my knowledge of Rod Stewart really is more from my childhood because he's always been there. Yeah. When I was a kid growing up, Rod Stewart was always on the TV on top of the pops, various music shows, the TV chat shows. And we've been trying to get him on the TV show forever, but he's just never been available. He's, a, you know, considering his age and he's super fit. You know, he's honestly, I've never seen anyone so fit and healthy in my life. <laughs> You know, he's incredible. He's looked out for himself a lot better than I have, uh, for sure. But, yeah, we tried to get him on the TV show for a long time. But, anyway, when he contacted Jules, he he also hadn't been present on other recordings he'd done, like other big band stuff. He'd, it had been done completely separately. And I think, you know, he had a, a problem with that. He, he hadn't enjoyed uh, that remote recording situation. So he wanted to be more hands-on. And also he, he wanted a big band, but he didn't, again, he, he wanted it to have a bit of an R&B sensibility. He didn't want it to be too ultra slick, you know. So the Jules Band, you know, we play a lot of stuff. We do R&B, rock and roll, pop, whatever, you know. And we can do all of that stuff and we have to as part of our job. So with the big band, you know, it, it's, yeah, that, that's what he wanted. He, he wanted. he wanted us the identity of, of the Jules Holland band and we so we started to record the album two years ago at Jules's studio which is very local to me here in southeast London uh, and Rod was there with us in in the room you know so we did it all together and that for him was the key he wanted it to be more organic he wanted that camaraderie going on you know and it was it was a blast it was uh it was so much fun because he, he's a really fun guy to be around he's like I mean this in the nicest possible way. He's a bit like a uh, like a big school kid, really. You know, in in the fact he just wants to have fun. He wants to have a great time. He's not too serious. He gets the job done, but you know, his vibe. You know, he's really just chilled and relaxed, and he, he's a funny guy. He's he's great company. So you you mentioned uh, it was like a, a big band thing. I don't know if you use the word jazz, but you mentioned uh, instilling some R and B vibes. Uh, are the songs from the 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 rock era or from the jazz era? The oh, no. I, I mean, I, I think they're probably great American songbook. You know, things like "Ain't Misbehaving" and "Pennies from Heaven" and all that oh. kind of stuff. You know, Rod Stewart singing "Pennies from Heaven." Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, <laughs> and and they were they were mostly his choices. I think. Jules also had a say in them as well, you know, so Jules may have suggested some too. But really it was Rod that, that contacted Jules. He started the ball rolling kind of thing. And um, and yeah, so we, we started to record the album. We The original producer we had was uh, a guy called Nitin Sawney, who's a very, very famous uh, musician himself and a big producer. He started off as the, the producer on the album. But then he wasn't able to finish it off. So halfway through, we had uh, Phil Manzanera take over as producer. And of course, Phil is a guitarist producer and he, he was in Roxy Music. Uh, he was a guitarist in that band. So he was, so we had two producers on it. Um, but to be honest, the nature of that music, 
you know, and we are a big band. We play that stuff a lot. You know, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't really a lot the producers had to do other than just let us get on with it, you know, and just, you know, m maybe make a few suggestions. But mostly we just played uh, and the charts and, we, and the arrangements are done by members of the band. Like some of our horn section, there's about five or six of the horn players and they're the band arrangers. So it's all in-house. You know, they all went to music college and they did arranging and stuff like that. So, so we just tend to get chord charts with some written notation on there, any pushes or fills, whatever. So mostly what I had was was just that, was just was just chord charts. So whatever I'm playing was made up in the moment on those on those recording sessions, you know. So um so yeah, we started doing that back in 2022 and it, it's finished and it's it's about to be released in uh, I think the 23rd of February. Okay, right around the time of the release of this video on for basically <laughs> only. Give or take a couple of days, whatever uh, whatever the closest Monday is. But uh, yeah. are you play yeah. mostly upright, all upright. What are you playing? I'm playing all upright on on this, and actually, um, that's a good point because the the gig with Jules has has changed a little bit recently. It's kind of come full circle to where I started because when I got the Jules gig in 1991. I took over from a couple of bass players. One was a guy called Keith Wilkinson, who was the bass player in Squeeze, and Jules had been using him for his own projects. But he'd also been using Pino Palladino a lot. I was waiting uh, for you to mention Pino's name. Yeah, yeah. So, and it was great. Pino and I used to be neighbours. We used to live in the street next to each other. We'd always see each other every day. But he he did a lot of stuff with Jules before I got the gig. But then when Squeeze reformed, and Keith went back with Squeeze, and Pino obviously carried on being Pino. Uh, Jules needed another bass player, but he this time round he specifically wanted someone who played upright bass. <clears throat> and um, I was doing some work with a sax, pl sax player that had already got the gig, and I got recommended. I did the audition and got the gig. But Jules only wanted upright because I said to him, I said, "Look, I play fretted. I said fretless, whatever you know." And he it was just all upright. So the first two or three years, that's all I used. The only reason why I stopped playing upright predominantly with Jules was, first of all, it became difficult to amplify the instrument on tour because we were playing massive venues and I'd never played venues like that before. I'd only ever played smaller jazz clubs and whatever. And I wasn't used to amplifying an acoustic double bass to, to that extent. So I, I began really... That was a struggle, a constant struggle to control the feedback and all that kind of thing. And then also we, we were doing a lot of TV stuff where the people we were playing with, acoustic upright bass just wasn't suitable. You know, we, we, we would, we'd be playing with people like Barry White and Shaka Khan and Roger Daltrey uh, and Jules wanted me to do everything on upright. And I said, Jules, this isn't going to work. This is going to, this is going to kill me. <laughs> You know, trying to play I Ain't Nobody and I'm Every Woman on, on, on Upright, you know. So, but eventually he let me double. He let me sort of do both. And for years, that's what happened. You know, the uh, you name know. Rod Stewart might incite the same reaction. How can you play Rod Stewart stuff on the Upright? <laughs> a whole different scope, a whole different concept. Well, well he, the thing is, what's happened is, as, as time has gone on and Jules has, has got older, um, you know, he... Basically, on on his TV shows, even if even if I can hear the, the the track was played on a bass guitar or keyboard bass, he still wants me to use upright, and and that's that's what he wants, you know. And and again, you know, we we did something on Jules's TV show, and I think we were playing some chic stuff, some really heavy duty sort of bass lines, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, Art Edwards bass lines on the upright, yeah, you know. And what? I said. To <laughs> well, the th thing is, yeah, I, I said to Joe, I said, look, I can do this. I can do it. I said, but if that's what you want, if you want all upright, that's fine. I said, I'm probably going to have to simplify some of the parts because some of the articulations are, are just, it's just too much for, for an upright bass, you know, because I'm used to playing with, with Jules. I predominantly play six string basses. I, I, I you know, if I'm going to play bass guitar at all, I'll use a six string because I want that extended range. And also for me, one of the benefits of playing the six string is, is just being able to stay in one position for longer periods of time. If I'm playing a four string, 
you know, there's a lot more shifts involved. And if you're sight reading, well, I mean, you, of course, you, you, you know this very well yourself. If you're sight reading on TV, you don't want to be making these big sort of leaps and taking your eye off the charts, you know. So if you can stay in that one position for longer, then it's great. So that's the reason why I predominantly use a six-string bass. But also just the articulation of it. So when Jules said to me, I want everything on upright, I'm thinking, okay, you're the boss. If that's what you want, <laughs> you know. Um, but I just said to him, I said, I'm probably going to have to simplify some some of the parts. And, and that's what I've been doing uh, quite recently. You know, I've, I've literally been, the, the gig has almost become 100% acoustic upright bass now, regardless of the genre. Yeah. Interesting. You said I something. That I, I have been criticised though because people say to me, "What's Dave thinking of? What is, is he out of his mind? You know, what what is he doing that for? You know, um, and and or, or worse, people will say, "Oh, that was a very bad choice of, of instrument." But what a lot of people don't realise is that, you know, I'm doing what Jules wants. You know, Jules is is the boss. You know, it's his TV show, it's his band. So if he wants something i mean i i can put my my thoughts forward i can kind of say well i'm not sure about that but that's that's really what he wants he just loves the acoustic bass so much and the sound and the vibe of it so there you go there are people that to this day i think will not acknowledge the electric bass guitar as a legitimate <laughs> musical instrument i interviewed a guy just yesterday named wayne brewer and he plays with Gary Brewer and the Kentucky Ramblers, bluegrass, right? He's a sixth generation bluegrass player. And he's a young guy. And and they were playing big venues. And and uh a lot of the bluegrass people will will not, they'll they'll just scoff at, at the idea of doing anything other than miking the bass, the thought of putting in a pickup, and, and they're playing these huge, you know, you reminded me before, we're playing these huge venues and, and things like that. So uh, he, he talked to his dad and he pleaded his case and his father said, well, hmm, you know, we have to walk that fine line. We have to balance it. And he says, well, here's a recording of these other bands using either uh, uh, you know, like a, a Fishman pickup is the one that he likes to use, or yeah. here's a recording of our show from last night. Here's the point I'm trying to make. So he, yeah, because uh, sure. you know, he said, you know, they, they would take like a, a sure SM58 and wrap it up in foam or something and stick it on there. And uh, it just, it, it did nothing but, but make a thump. <laughs> so, so, so what are you using where, uh, you know, if you are playing a big venue, you, you use yeah. a pickup on your upright bass now, right? Yeah. Well, well he, he is a very, very good point because I, I did actually stop using an acoustic double bass for a long time, and I used an electric upright bass, like a, a stick skeletal bass. <clears throat> and and for me, I, I was pretty happy with that because I got that sounding pretty close to an amplified double bass. When you say stick, excuse me, do you mean literally the, the Chapman stick, or do you mean... Oh, like no, no, sorry. I, I, I meant like a stick bass as, as in like a, a, an electric upright bass. Like, like NS Design? Well, the one I use, you know, it, I actually use a Yamaha one, but it, it's that it's that thing. It's just, you know, the central spine with a couple of shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but the thing is, you know, that I did a lot of work with mine, getting the right strings, uh, you know, using the right preamp and that kind of thing. So I was pretty happy that I got that close, pretty close to sounding like maybe not an acoustic double bass, but an amplified acoustic double bass. <laughs> and the great thing with using... An EUB is uh, they're easy to transport. I, I give it to our crew. It goes in a fly case in the truck. I don't see it from one gig to the next. Um, and also it's easy to amplify because it's a solid bodied instrument. There's no acoustic chamber there. So for years, that's what I did and life was good. Now, what happened is I, I recently got another double bass. I've got one that was made for me back in 2012 by a London luthier called Roger Dawson. Rod, Roger was one of the best double bass luthiers on the planet. And he made me this beautiful full-size bass. It's huge, really gorgeous instrument. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago, and he'd been my go-to guy for 30 years. But, uh, you know, lots of great memories, but I have the bass that he made for me, ju just for me, I think. So, but I wouldn't take that on tour because of the value of it. 
it's it's too precious. But I recently got my, got a new bass, which is made by a company called Stentor. And it's a smaller instrument. It's a three-quarters instrument, so it's a bit easier to handle. Um, and I I wasn't going to use it on the Jules gig because, again, I was using this electric upright and bass guitar. But I took it along to a rehearsal, and I was just fooling around with it. And Jules said, oh, man, that sounds great. You know, why don't you use it on the gigs? And I'm thinking, oh, no, what have I done? What have yeah. I done? Because I, I, all I could think of then was back at the very beginning with all the feedback problems you know but he was the thing though he that there's a big difference with our on-stage setup now because i about 15 years ago for the first time i started to use inia monitors now the reason for this is that jules and the front of house guy were concerned about the volume on stage that we were all making because it's you know like i said it's a it's a sax section trombone trumpet five-piece rhythm singers there's a lot of noise <laughs> there's a lot of noise up there you know uh, and I think Jules's hearing was being affected as well. So we were told everyone we need to bring the volume down, which we did. But then I'm playing this electric upright, and I'm thinking I can't really hear myself, and especially intonation-wise, you know. So that's when I started to use in ears, <clears throat> and it was it was a revelation because I'd never used them before. So all of a sudden, in my I'm hearing every single note I play. I can hear people in the band that I've never heard before. You know, we, we used to use those floor wedge monitors, but mm -hmm. now with these in-ears, they were so clear, crystal clear, and the separation was stunning. And I'm thinking, wow, why haven't I done this before? The only problem was then that I felt that I was in a different room. You know, I felt separate from the band. I was hearing what I wanted to hear. And also I could hear the bass very well. I just couldn't feel the bass anymore. I think I know where you're going with this story. Go on. <laughs> exactly. So Gilson, our drummer, who was also on in ears, he'd been using this drum throne that vibrates when you hit the kit. And he was able to get rid of those huge side fill monitors that drummers used to have in the old days. And then the same company, which is Porter and Davis, they were making a bass platform, similar thing. And, and I was taking the prototypes out for them and reporting back. And then eventually they came up with the, the commercially available one. And the, the platform, when you stand on it, and I'm playing, and it vibrates with each note. So I'm hearing the, you know, the, the everything with the in-ears, all the, all the notes, all the clarity, but I'm feeling that, <laughs> that thump from the platform. And I'm thinking to myself, this is fantastic. Life is good. I finally found the magical combination. Now, what happened is when Jules saw me playing this acoustic bass again, and he sort of said, well, why don't we try and use that on the tour? And, and I thought to myself, well, actually, this will be interesting because I've not used an acoustic double bass since switching to in-ears and the platform. And I did, and it was a, a revelation because obviously now the whole reason why it works, I've got a pickup on the bass. I've got a Fishman full circle pickup, and this goes through a Fishman little preamp that I can make all sorts of adjustments to. <clears throat> but my amplification, which is behind me, which is all Bergantino, that's still on. And it needs to be on because not everybody in the band uses in-ear monitors. So there has to have some, there has to be some bass presence on stage. There's only half the band that use in-ears. And I can still hear it to some extent. You know, it's, it's not completely, you know, I, I'm, I'm still using it. But really, with a, with a lowered volume of that rig, the in-ears and the platform, I can now play that acoustic double bass without any feedback issues like I used to get in the old days. So this, so the addition of all this technology has enabled me to go back to playing an acoustic double bass, which is fantastic. Wow. Uh, just on a tangent here, but it wouldn't work for the upright bass, but for the electric, uh, I remember you telling me about that platform during the last um, interview. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I still do. I was at a bass show in Chicago a couple of years ago. And there's a guy actually from Michigan. His name is Yerko Sepulveda. And he has a strap that you put on that does something similar to that platform that you were talking about. It vibrates. You can feel the vibrations in the strap while you're wearing it. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, I've seen this. I mean, maybe it's the same thing. It might be called the backbeat, I think, maybe. I think but that's it. 
yeah, it, it's like yeah, it's like yeah, uh, it's about yay big, and it clips onto the actual the the strap itself, you know. And I I have seen those, but obviously with with upright, right? It's not really ideal, and the platform is much more powerful as well. It literally goes through your whole body, you know. They call it um they call it a KT platform, which stands for kinetic transfer, and it just it it, it makes your body. Well, it was great with the with the electric upright, which didn't have an acoustic chamber to it. It yeah. was great for that because the vibrating platform made that instrument feel like it had an acoustic chamber that was moving. So it was really good for that. But um, but also it makes your it fools your body into thinking you're playing in front of a much louder rig. You know, and, and it, it makes you feel as though the speakers are really moving the air, which, of course, they're not. The speakers are nice and quiet, so everyone's happy. It's just the vibration under your feet, you know. So it's it's a really cool thing. I mean, but it's really mo it's mostly beneficial when you're using in-ears, I kind of think. But to be honest, I, I, I pretty much use in-ears 100% of the time with Jules, you know. I tried taking them out recently to remind me what it was like in the old days of not having them. And I came off stage and my ears were ringing like crazy. I had a headache. And, and, and also the sound in the room, we, 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 when we're on tour, these venues are so different, you know, sort of arenas and theatres and whatever. And it's difficult to get a good, you know, you're at the mercy of the room yeah. and the room's acoustics. But if you always use in-ears and the platform, which I do, it's constant every night. It's the, it's the same sound, you know, so... You know, every now and again, I'll take them out to remind me of how it was. And I'm thinking, uh-uh, uh-uh, back, back with the in-ears, back with the platform. I'm good. <laughs> I'm sitting here just wondering, what, what would guys like like Jimmy Blanton or Scott LaFaro or any of those people think about what we're talking about? Oh, I know. I know. Well, do you know what? I, I did I, I did a podcast uh, well, I, well, I was. it was actually with Ron Carter. Ron Carter was the main guest, but I was brought in um uh, uh as a as a you know like a side a side guest you know like a co co-host type thing and it was fantastic because I, i'd met him before but i've not i'd spoke to him very much and one of the questions i said to him was i i just can't imagine how the d double bass players back in the day were able to play and to hear themselves and for their fingers not to be torn to ribbons you, you know from having to dig in and i asked him i said well what was the what was the key there, you know? And he basically said it was everyone just was playing at a certain volume. You know, in other words, if you couldn't hear somebody else in that, in that whether it was the Miles Davis group, whatever, if you couldn't hear someone, you reduced your volume so that you could. Now, these days, everybody wants to be heard and everyone's <laughs> it's like, you know, everyone wants to be the loudest person in the band, you know. So back then, I think there was a lot more sensitivity involved and he said also where he would position himself with with the bass as well you know he would make sure he'd stand in a certain area of, of the piano you know he would pick a certain spot but it was you know he said it was much more to do with the sensitivity of the musicians and people playing you know so if, if, if we can't hear Ron on the bass we, this this is madness you know and they just played quieter you know but it, it's it, I mean these days it's it's not as it's not as simple as that, you know, and, and people aren't always as sensitive. Exactly. Well, I'm sure there were people like that in those days, too. But you remind me, you mentioned Ain't Misbehaving earlier. And I, I played that show with The Fifth Dimension. Oh, and, okay. And I was the house bassist at the Hirschfeld Theater in Miami Beach. And that was one of the shows that came in. And uh, that was all on Upright. And they put us up, it, it, the theater was in a hotel, and they put us in some room up at the top of the hotel for rehearsal that was, a, uh, it was under construction. There was no electricity in that room. Oh. So I had my upright and I'm doing the rehearsal. By the end of the rehearsal, my fingers were ripped to shreds. And we hadn't even started the show yet. So now I've got whatever the show was, two weeks, five weeks, whatever it was. And I'm like, oh, my God. So that's the uh, happy memory. Not so happy memory. You Well, you did, you did say to me, you noticed this blood blister on my, on my finger. you know. And the thing is, I mean, I've been playing... Uh, upright bass and bass since I was 15. The problem is, the reason why this happened, actually, we, we did a, a promotional video with Rod a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, which is which hasn't been broadcast yet. It's gonna it's gonna be coming out soon. 
but and it was a cut down band. We couldn't have the full band there, so it was just me, Jules, and the drummer, a couple of horns, and and Rod and his singers. Now the thing is, we were miming to this to this track. It was all is all about the visual side of it. But the thing is, when you when you're miming, you know, when you're playing double bass, you can't just tickle the strings because it's going to look fake. It's going to look fake and things. So. I had no amp at all. I was completely amplified. And they were playing the track super loud in the room so Rod could hear it and mount it. So I had no choice but to just really dig in, you know. And at the end of it, you know, these blisters were like up here because I just thought, I, you know, I did, if, if I'd have been amplified, I wouldn't have had to play so loud, but then that wouldn't have worked with playback. It would have caused problems, you know. And I just wanted it to look authentic. So yeah, it, even after all these years, this this still happens, you know. And that's the thing when when I get like young bass guitar students come to me and they say, you know, we're thinking of making the switch, which we, you know, we'd love to play upright, you know. And all they're looking at really is just the simplicity of four strings. They're tuned the same as a regular bass guitar, and as far as they're concerned. What else is there to worry about? <laughs> you know, there's nothing. That's it. It's, it's job done. You know, and um, and I and I, I then have to tell them all the things that they need to know. You know, about the the limited uh, fingering possibilities due to the this the large spaces where the notes are. You know, I said you don't really get to play bass guitar fingering, especially in the lower positions, really, you know, maybe when you play higher up. But I said, you know, the whole thing with the wear and tear, you know, the the amplifying of it, the maintenance of it, you need far more maintenance for an acoustic double bass than a bass guitar, you know, and you often have to go to luthier. And, and by the end of it, I've listed all these things and they've kind of gone, do you know what? I think I'll just stick with the bass guitars. Well, you know, that was, it wasn't my plan to put them off. I'm just trying to be realistic, you know. Yeah. It's not to the faint-hearted, the big bull fiddle. That's right. And it's funny, you, you remind me of something else. That guys that start on the upright and then switch to electric, I always think of Steve Bailey and Brian Bromberg. When they get up to like the 12th fret on the electric bass, they go into thumb position. That's right. <laughs> I don't want to learn a new technique. I already got to learn a new technique. I got so. I just thought that was sick. I, I mean, I, I actually, I did. Well, obviously, I'm a brass player to, to begin with. That's how I started. But when I when I became a bass player, I did get a bass guitar first. But I, I quickly then got a double bass. So there wasn't a long period. It was an, only a matter of months, I think. And the reason why I got a bass guitar first was because they were more readily available. There was there was a couple of shops in my hometown, and nobody, none of them sold uh, classical stringed instruments. They just were guitars and keyboards, or whatever. So that's the you know, had there been a shop that had sold a double bass, I probably would have got that first. But there was only a few months in between, you know. So I've pretty much been playing them both, you know, the same length of time. Whereas I, I know some pro players, and literally they've been bass guitarists for like thirty odd years. And then they decide to to play upright, you know. And these are these are pro players, but why not, you know? If you know, there's there's no time limit on it, you know. But I've pretty much always played them both from from the beginning, really. I think there was some encouragement from your school teacher, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what? Um, he he actually wasn't a teacher at the school. He was a visiting peripatetic brass teacher. And because uh, I started off playing the euphonium when I was when I first went to secondary school, I wanted to play the saxophone. They didn't have one. Uh, and then I picked the trombone and they gave it to somebody else. So I got the euphonium and I'm thinking, hang on a minute. You know, this 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 isn't, you know, what I'm seeing on, on TV on top of the pops. You know, I'm seeing saxophone players, you know, uh, and it looked really cool and sexy. And I've got this euphonium. I'm thinking, I'm not sure about this, but at least. You know, it got me into reading music and it got me into the mindset of being a musician, you know. But then I quickly then got hold of a trombone and made the switch. And the next teacher I had was this guy called Phil Johnson. And he he was my trombone teacher. I played some tuba as well, which I still do now, but it was predominantly trombone. And you know what, Phil, it almost didn't happen because... By the time I went to him, I was 14. I'd had a break in between playing the euphonium and I'd had this couple of year break and I'd gone back and I thought to myself, there's going to be no problem with me kind of volunteering to play an instrument. He said, I can't take you on, you're too old. And I said, are you 
14, really, you know. And it wasn't his decision. It was the, it was the school's curriculum because what it was, they didn't want to give instruments out to, to kids that were on the verge of leaving school. They wanted the instruments to go to the, the kids that are just coming into the school kind of thing, you know. So when he said that, he said, you're too old. That wasn't his own opinion. That was the school curriculum thing, you know. Anyway, I was really enthusiastic. I really wanted to play this instrument, the trombone. So he dug one out of the cupboard. He showed me how to play it. And he said, take it away, come back in two weeks and let's see, you know. Now I took this home and I just fell in love with a trombone. I just went completely nuts. You know, I played it, I couldn't, couldn't leave it alone, like seven hours a day, just couldn't stop playing it, loved it, you know. And then I came back after two weeks and he was thinking, I'm just gonna go, and it's gonna be horrible. And he's gonna think, yeah, I was right. Get out of here, you know. And I started to play and he went, oh, okay. And he said, well, that's it. You're my people. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on. I'm going to go against the school regulations and you are now going to be my trombone people. And within six months, he put me in for my grade four or my grade five. And, and, and you know, he, and I just made so much progress because I loved it so much. And I practiced like crazy, you know. And I so I studied with him for those two years. But then when I took up the bass just for fun, bass guitar, he heard me playing. Now, bearing in mind, he, he'd showed me how to read music. I was reading four clefs as a trombonist. So when I got the bass, there was nothing I could do. I got to jump in. Okay, bass and treble, that's obvious. What, uh, tenor clef? Alto clef? Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. Ten tenor and alto. Alto yeah. clef? How many yeah, yeah. trombone charts are written in alto clef? <laughs> or tenor well, clef, for that matter? I, well, I mean, to be honest, what, what it is, so, yeah, bass clef predominantly is, is the one, but... Yeah, I have a lot of trombone books because they're great for electric bass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when uh, over... I don't know if it's the same in the States, but over here, because I was... When I was playing the trombone, I was playing in every band imaginable. I was playing brass bands, orchestras, funk bands, pop bands, big bands, every genre before I even picked up a bass you know so but in in brass bands in the uk trombone is always in treble clef i'm still not quite sure why that is wow. but it's always treble clef so so i had to learn it for that because i was playing in a brass band and then the the tenor and alto was predominantly in orchestral stuff i played in a couple of orchestras and obviously the range of the trombone is so vast it's an incredible range of, of instrument you know and the one i played had a had a plug on it as well which meant you could play lower notes not on, usually on a tenor trombone so the the as opposed to writing tons of ledger lines the alto and the tenor clef were used so i had to learn to read those as well but they were that's that was predominantly in orchestral do stuff. you have eight va over in england <laughs> well yeah there is that but i i don't know i don't know what that's a good point. That's a good point. You know, I mean, to be honest now, if I write charts, if I'm doing an, if I'm doing a bass part that goes up into thumb position, I, to be honest with you, if, if it's a solo, I tend to switch to treble clef. If I'm doing my own transcriptions, I'll go so far with bass clef and I'll switch to treble and I'll do it like that. You know, um, I, that's just my preferred way. But yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the 8VE thing is, is definitely a thing, but I don't know. It, it's it, it was one of those things, though. I had to learn tenor and alto clef as well. So by the time I picked up a bass guitar, which was when I was about fifteen, um, there was nothing that I couldn't play on on bass guitar because the the stuff that I had to play on trombone was so complex. Um, I had no problem with it. Now my trombone teacher Phil Johnson, when he heard me playing electric at school, and this was just for fun. He said, wow, he said, you, you can play that really well. He said, if you take up the acoustic double bass, he said, you will get a lot of work. He said, because every band needs a bass player, not every band needs a trombone player. So, um, so that was it. It was, his, it was his, him saying that, which is the reason why I went out and, and got it. You know? Now, the other thing was, he, it was, it was partly self-serving for him because he was a fixer in... Uh, in the area you know so he would book musicians for for theater work shows 
uh, radio jingles, TV adverts, and stuff. A fixer is that what you call it over yeah, there? Yeah, fixer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would think of a, a contractor is what we would call. Yeah, it. yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, over here, that's what we tend to say. And so he then started to get me gigs, but on more what so, instrument? Yeah, well, well, more so as a bass player because. He was, although he was a trombone teacher, he he was still doing gigs on the trombone. So he didn't want to do himself out of, <laughs> you know, out of a trombone gig, bless his heart. And I get that, you know, but he was booking me as a doubling bass player. And so it was my trombone teacher not only uh, changed my life that day at school when he took me on. It's that kind of sliding doors moment, you know, because yeah. he could have gone, when I went to him and said, I want to play the trombone, Mr. You know, he could have gone, he, he might have had a headache. He might have had a bad morning and he could have gone just no forget it but the fact he took me on my that was when my life changed it was a sliding door moment you know but also he then booked me as a, as a bass player so that's that's when i turned pro when i left school pretty much when i was 17 and he and he got me like loads of work as as a bass player you know and then i i realized what he said was right you know you're going to get a lot more work as a bassist than a than a trombone player you know but i still Love the, the trombone, and I play it to this day. I play trombone, I play tuba. I love playing tuba, uh, and that's great because it is the original bass instrument. Tuba and zuzophone, they were there before the acoustic bass came along, you know. So, uh, but the great thing is, I lost contact with my teacher, and to be honest, with all, with the greatest of respect, him, I thought he might have passed away. I rediscovered him a few years ago, and he came to one of the Jules gigs with his wife, oh. and I hadn't seen him since I was 19, I think. And I'm 60 now. So, um, and it was great because I got to thank him for all he did for me, you know, teaching me the instrument, teaching me to read, encouraging me to play the bass, getting me gigs. And I made sure that Jules gave him a shout out at one of the, one of the gigs we did. He, That's beautiful. You know, because, because yeah, he, he changed my life. If it wasn't for my old trombone teacher, Phil Johnson, I wouldn't be here doing this. So, so God bless his heart, you know. That's funny. On on Facebook, I heard from my high school teacher, Mr. Lippa, who's now 81 years old. And uh, he just oh, reached wow. out to, I guess he discovered Facebook, started looking up old students. And uh, and I reached out. I said, hello. He says, oh, John Lieben, I remember you. You did a theme and variations on a, whatever it was, which was very good. I was like, wow, you remember that? Oh, wow. Well, you know what, though? I, I was always worried that if, if Phil, my trombone teacher, I was always worried that he was going to, he'd been following my career. And because I always, always used to mention him in interviews, I always used to give him a shout out, you know. And obviously, he's a businessman, you know, he, being a fixer is a businessman. And I thought to myself, I hope he, when I meet up with him, he's not going to try and tra charge me commission for the last 45 years of my career. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, I, I'll tell you, though, I, uh, I, I like to get out my old uh, Vivaldi sonatas just for fun once in a while on the upright, and then uh, occasionally they'll go up into into tenor clap. I go, oh boy, all the mental calories I, I have to burn. But the only encounter I've ever had with alto clef was in my orchestration classes in college when I had to write for viola. Other than that, I, I've never <laughs> seen it anywhere. So, <laughs> that's okay. Bass and you know, bass is usually enough. Bass and and treble and yeah. And, a little bit of tenor, okay. What else is uh, is is going on that's keeping you busy these days? You you just uh, you know the, I guess you just finished up the the record with Rod. That's all done and it's just yeah yeah well, well yeah we we finished it last early last year. So it's like I said, it's all done now and it is it is being released. So we we just um, at the moment we're just doing promo uh, for that. In fact, Jules and Rod, they they they're, I think they might still be in America because they just did the. Um, What's the, the, the Fallon show called? Jimmy it... Fallon. The Tonight Show. That was Tonight John Hopkins' old show. And then Jay Leno. and That's right, yeah. So they have they just did it, I think, two nights ago. But it was but the thing is they weren't able to bring us bring I don't us stay up that late anymore. Oh so. uh, really? Okay, yeah. It's <laughs> it's on YouTube. I just watched it today. But uh, but yeah, it was just it was just Jules, Rod, and Rod's BVs, and they were using uh, the house band of the show. I'm sorry, uh, e EVs? Uh, backing vocals. Ah, okay. And, um, I, yeah, I, I like to shorten things. Well, <laughs> I, I, I can ask and look stupid, but then I'll know it, or I can just uh, not ask and not know it. So Yeah, so so Rod, Rod's got three girl uh, backing vocalists who, who were on the album, so he wanted them to be there. But it just wasn't realistic to take an 18-piece band all over to America. 
when the show itself has got a house band. So, so Jules and Rod did the interview with him, uh, and and then they played one of the tracks of the album, which I think it's uh, almost like being in love. I think was the track they played. Rod Stewart doing that stuff. I, I got to check that out. Yeah, so it's it's on YouTube. It, it, I just was watching it today myself. Um, but the good thing, obviously, the we, Jules' band, we didn't get to do that. But the, the good thing is it's all promotion for the album. I mean, it's going to be good for us, whatever happens. So what's happening here in the UK, we've got a lot of TV promotion coming up on our, on our, our own TV shows. So that will include us in the band. Um, and we've got some some more intimate gigs. So the gigs we normally do with Jules, they're often huge venues. But I think with, because Rod's going to be joining us on these, they wanted to do, I mean, they're probably, when I say small, I'm talking about still maybe a couple of thousand capacity. But for Jules and Rod as individuals, that's still quite small, you know. So we're doing a number of gigs here in London at the end of this month after the album's released. So... And, and and every time I look at the the, the bookings, it, it keeps saying sold out, a new, a new gig added, like new show added kind of thing. So it looks, even though the album's not out yet, it looks as though it's already got this huge momentum, you know. Now, the thing is, of course, because the question is where, what happens after that, you know, because we've, with Jules, we've already got our tours in place, our, our Jules Holland tours. And I'm sure Rod probably has, his own tours of his own band. So I wonder, are we going to do an actual full-on tour with with Rod and Jules Holland with this combination? I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not, because it's logistically it's going to take a lot of working out, you know. But that would be the dream, you know, that would be the great to with the albums out and for us to go and do a big, massive tour altogether. Because, you know, I mean, Jules obviously is still a very famous guy, particularly in the UK. But obviously, Rod is more of an international superstar, you know. So, where so our association with Rod is is going to be great for us, you know. It's definitely going to increase our own uh, profile and and great exposure for us, you know. So yeah, we we literally are just waiting for the emails coming in telling us when the next gig is, when the next TV show is. So that's great, you know. That's kind of cool. But the other thing is um, on a much you know, quieter level. Uh, my wife, Lucy, um, Lucy Marilyn uh, is a professional name. She's a professional singer. She's a jazz singer. And we do lots of gigs together. If I'm not working with Jules, we do loads of stuff in London with a lot of great uh, British jazz musicians. And again, it, it's just standards, really. You know, we, we, you know, she doesn't write her own stuff, but it's, it's all, you know, the American standards kind of thing. Uh, and we do lots of gigs, but the thing is, when in lockdown, Lucy's project, she took up the uh, the banjo of all the things. She always wanted to play the banjo, and I said to her, I said, well, why not? You know, it's like loads of people are doing all sorts of things in lockdown. You know, things they've dreamt of doing for years and kept putting it off. So she's been playing that, and she's really good. You know, she's been studying like crazy, and and she sounds great on it. You know. And of course, because I still play, I'm still a brass player at heart, you know. So I'm I'm at home with my tuba. I've got a big C XO tuba, um, and I've got my trombone as well. So we literally are doing duets at home. Like she was, well, she's singing, playing the banjo, and I'm playing tuba. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is this is all right, you know. This sounds this sounds pretty good. Now our son Oscar, who is he's almost seven, he's been having piano lessons. And actually, he's really good. He's about to do his grade one. Now, he's not, obviously, he's nowhere near good enough to actually, you know, play proper songs kind of thing, you know. But I'm think, I said to Lucy, I said, well, you know, it would be great having a piano player in the house. So let's encourage that. Let's encourage that, you know. But the fact is, with Lucy singing, playing the banjo, a chordal instrument, and me playing tuba, playing bass lines, and doing little solos, I said to her, man, let's do some gigs. You know, let's do some gigs like this and maybe get a drummer involved or, or a keyboard player. But, you know, uh, and, and so that's that's what we're that's what we're working on. We just we're just working on some songs of what would be good to do. You know, because like I said, I I love being a brass player. That's what I started off, you know. So it's so I've kind of come full circle w with it, you know, and the tuba kind of makes more sense for me because as a bass player, it is 
it is taking the function of of the bass instrument you know i had thought of taking up the tuba years ago when i was i, was, I said I play upright. I play electric. If I play tuba, I'll never be out of work. But as <laughs> it was, I was doing between four and five hundred gigs a year on electric and upright. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was keeping plenty busy. You you have a lot of experience uh, as uh, you've spoken very highly of your educators and your teachers. And I want to take this opportunity to ask you, as I mentioned at the beginning, for Bass Players Only is a bass instruction site. Got people from all over the world. Pretty much all fifty. St- States and about 50, 60 countries worldwide coming to for bass players only every day to learn bass. And I did throw in that uh, a lot of them are over 50. That's most of the people I'm attracting, mostly men, a fair bit of women, but mostly men in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I've got a few students in their 80s. And they're not trying to make a career out of music. They have some time now they didn't have before. They want to play some classic rock riffs with their buddies. They want to play some blues shuffles. They want to play maybe some walking bass or some R&B, punk, whatever it is that they love. And um, also a lot of times when you get to be in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, things like arthritis creep in and tendonitis and things like that. So I'm just telling you all this to give you a context because I want to ask you, Dave, what advice could you impart to somebody like that who wants to learn bass what should they be focused on what should they be thinking about oh sure well that's i mean it's a it's a great question i mean i I get asked a lot about about this from from players more so younger guys you know um i mean obviously it's it's difficult for me because i've been in the industry for so long you know and the industry has changed so much and teaching methods and learning methods have changed. I mean, when I was a kid, I couldn't find a bass teacher anywhere in my hometown. I couldn't find a single one. Trombone, yeah, but so actually on bass guitar and double bass, I'm really self-taught, you know, and the only thing I could do was to go out and buy a couple of books. And at the time, all I could find were the Carol Kay books. Okay, I knew you were going to say that, yeah. Carol Kay, there was one by another lady called Valda Hammock, which I got. And on, on the double bass, I got the Samandal book, which is the, the classic. Uh, know it well. Volume yeah, one. Thank you. yeah. <laughs> and the other one was the was Ray Brown, the Ray Brown method. You know, yeah. the thing is, uh, for years. By the way, that's, that's called volume one. He never did do a volume two. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I still got it up on the shelf, man. It's cool. It's, it's cool. But, um, but if, so the thing is, I. But obviously those books, they, they did help. I'm not going to deny that. But there's so much missing information. You know, there's so much more to know kind of thing, you know. So for me, I the only way I could fill in the gaps early on was to watch TV. And I was watching TV and I was watching Pino Palladino come on TV and I was watching what he was doing and listening. And then I'd see old footage of Ray Brown and Ron Carter and those guys. And literally, I'm just watching them. I'm just, and then any magazine that came out where there was an interview, you know, and that was it really. And it was literally just piecing together little bits and pieces like that, you know, and and obviously that is such a slow process. You know, it took me a long time because we didn't have the internet, whatever. Now, obviously now it's the opposite, you know, people have probably got too much stimulus, you know, you've just got, you know, I mean, I had to walk for miles to find a book, on how to play the bass. I had to walk five miles to get that book. And like now you press a button and Can you've you tell got your son that story. Say again. Can you tell your son that story. I had yeah. to walk <laughs> uphill both ways in the snow. I know. He doesn't know he's born, you know. But I, I think well the, the, the good thing, the good thing about playing bass, and, and I'm talking particularly about bass guitar is, and this isn't being derogatory to to us and our instrument, but the truth of it is, I think compared to every other instrument, it's probably the easiest one to to learn to play reasonably quickly and and re- and reasonably well kind of thing you know you don't have i mean for instance if you're a brass player you can't just pick up something because you've got to learn the fingering you've got to get your embouchure in shape that takes time a long 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 time you know and also if you're playing piano you know you've got to know chords melody bass lines comping solos whatever Whereas if you take a bass guitar, really, most of the time, you're just playing one note at a time. And a lot of bass lines, classic bass lines, are not that complicated, you know. So actually, it's it's a pretty good instrument for an older player to take up, 
because there's less frustration, I think, with it, because you can get hold of a bass guitar and you can you can get pretty proficient on it in a short space of time compared to if you were trying to do that on piano or guitar. I think that's that's a very good thing, you know. But I, I, I think it's a case of you, there's no one answer to, to, to do all this stuff. I mean, I studied with lots of different people, but not for any length of time, just a lesson here, a lesson there. Then it was, what's in that book? What's in that magazine? What's on this recording? You know, so it was all kind of little bits from everywhere kind of thing. So, and I kind of think these days, I mean, obviously, you know, your, your, your own sort of platform, I mean, that's a fantastic re resource you know, for bass players only, you know, and I'm not just saying that it is, it is an amazing resource, you know, and, and I, I, I love what, what you're doing, you know, but I kind of think it's, it's great to, to look at like a number of things, you know, like, I mean, like I said, transcribing for me was, was a big deal. You know, I learned probably more than I've ever learned from doing transcriptions of bass lines, uh, you know, solos and stuff like that. And I've got tons of them. I've got like thousands and thousands of transcriptions, you know. Um, and because you really get inside the player when you do that, you know. And also, you know, it's kind of, you, you know, you, you hear things that you, for years, you've been playing it by ear and you've been playing it wrong and you transcribe it and you're thinking, oh, that's what it is, you know. And with all the technology you've got to be able to slow it down, and to do it, but, but I love transcriptions because number one, you get to really get inside the mind of that player. I've, I, I love transcribing James Jameson stuff. I, 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 to this day, I still do it. I still do loads and loads of them, you know. And it's just fascinating how you, you even know how he's fingering something. You just know you, when you do the transcription, you can say, I know exactly how, how he's doing that kind of thing. But also the great thing is with that, you know, and you've got the transcription. Now, I, I did for once in my life, the Jameson one. Yeah, that's a good one. Years, I did it years and years ago. I mean, what a tour de force that is. Unbelievable. Yes. It's like it, it's like a solo in, in itself, you know. Now, I did it, but I wasn't using it. But it, I got a great deal from it, from the actual experience. <clears throat> I always say the hard work is its own reward. Even if you don't get to use it, it's still a great thing. But then all of a sudden, someone came on Jules' TV show and, and Jules said, oh, what do you want to perform? And they said, oh, we want to do for once in my life, you know. And I'm kind of going, hello. And then I thought, oh, they're going to change the key, man. They're going to, and they said, no, no, original key. And I'm kind of going, yes, yes, I've got, I've got my transcription, you know. And I used it on the TV show. But, you know, I mean, that for me is, you know, and, and also I, I have to say this. When I studied later on, it was what I was studying more was harmony than anything else because what I hadn't studied when I was younger was was that. So I'd studied technique, like reading, transcriptions. The one thing that was lacking with me was my knowledge of harmony. So when I came to London, I made sure that I studied with people that had that was their speciality. They'd been to Berkeley or whatever, you know. So that was for me. That was bridging the gap. But the other thing I would say as well is it's really important that w when I started out, everything I did was was written down. I was reading music all the time and I was really good at it. That was my forte. And that's all I got called to do that. And I just thought, well, this is how it is. Then I started to do gigs and people would start to call out songs. And I'm kind of going, oh, where, where's the chart? And they said, oh, there, there isn't the chart. You just got to, you know, use your ears. And I'm kind of going... And, and I, I was lost. I was completely lost. This is when I was much, much younger, you know, because everything I played was always written down. And it, it was a real, a big lesson for me. And I thought to myself, wow, I didn't realise that in this industry, you've got to have great ears as well. You've got to know a ton of songs. You've got to have a great repertoire at your disposal and, a, and lots of genres as well. So that for me was the other big challenge. And that was great when I got the Jules gig because there were no charts. There are no charts with, with Jules. You know, we have to, when we play with people on the TV show, we get given a recording, we get emailed a recording and we have to learn it however way we need to. I always transcribe everything. Together or individually? Oh no, individually. We, we, all, we all get it emailed individually. And we all have to go away and we have to learn that. Now, some guys in Jules' band don't read music. You know, the drummer doesn't read, the guitarist doesn't read, Jules himself doesn't read a great deal. 
So they've got no choice, really. They've got to just listen and listen and play and listen, whatever. Now, because I love doing transcriptions, when I get a recording to play on the TV show, the first thing I do is to transcribe everything, every song, note for note. And it's because, one, I enjoy doing it. I, I really love the process. But it also means that it's completely accurate. I've got exactly what was on the record. Now, I'll then go to, say, the, the studio, and if the person, the artist there, and if they turn around to me, and some of them have said, wow, you really nailed that. You know, Martha Reeves said to me, when we played this, all these Jameson bass lines, all this Motown stuff, she said to me, said, wow, you must really love James Jameson. I said, well, I do. I said, but what makes you say that? You know, she said, because I was listening. You played those lines. Perfect, man. You played them. That, and that's it, you know, because I'd done, you know, I hadn't just listened to them and kind of gone, yeah, you know, it's, that's that's close. That's close. For me to show the full respect, I wanted to – so I do the transcription anyway. But on the other side of it, some of the artists will turn around and say, Dave, you know, you don't have to play what's on the record. You know, you can loosen up. You can do your own thing. And I'm fine with that too because, like I said, over time my ears – developed you know I, I had to develop that that was what was lacking when I was much younger was my 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 ears really weren't as good you know but the thing is I I like to start with the transcription because then it's there I've got the information there you know if I turn up to a tv show and I haven't done that and I'm just kind of going yeah it's, it's this is close and they kind of go uh-uh no it's not and they clock it then I'm I'm done for because I haven't done the work, you know. So for me, it's about doing the work first, you know. So, so that's the thing about, you know, going back to the educating older guys. I think one of the, the biggest issues is the reading side of it, because a lot of guys can pick up a lot of stuff from watching, uh, you know, from doing online courses and watching your own uh, videos. I think that's great. I think what a lot of them have problems with is, is the reading side of it, you know. Now, for me, and I'm sure for you as well, reading is music. It's so simple. I, d I don't think about it because I've been doing it for 45 years, you know. But the key thing is that we did it earlier on. And it's like Oscar, my son is six. He can read music. He can play both hands on the piano. He can read bass clef. He can read treble clef. He knows what can all he read alto clef. <laughs> Do you know what? It wouldn't surprise me if he could. But that's the that's the amazing thing about kids. You know, the 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 plasticity of the brain. Yes, it's unbelievable. He picks up stuff, and I'm not just saying him. All kids, they pick up stuff so. And so, he's just doing it, man. This kid knows more about music at six than I knew at sort of fifteen, and sixteen. You know, so he did it early on. You know, you get the hard work out of the way, kind of thing, and then you just have fun. But I think. Guys who take up the instrument now, it's not too bad getting the, the technique together and even the, the styles. It's more, I think it's more the reading of the music that a lot of players, in my experience, and that's not just older guys as well, that's younger players too. I think, because it's such a massive discipline, isn't it? Re reading music. And, and if you've done it earlier when you're at school, when, and it wasn't even a choice, when I took up the trombone, my trombone teacher put some music in front of me and said, right, this is where we start from. He didn't just say, right, just play some jazz, <laughs> you know, just make it. He said, so from day one, I had to learn to read, you know, so I had that discipline way, way back, you know. I think I think the reading is a bit more difficult for older players, really, you know, but not not at all impossible. It's still, it's all doable, you know. What a bunch of value bombs that was, <laughs> that was i wonder what you're going to say then what a bunch of oh no. and, uh, <laughs> i'll tell you that there's only one thing that that i i would like to touch on i i agree with everything that you said and i'm sure you agree with what i'm about to say uh yes it, it's as far as being a relatively easy instrument to take up the the electric bass okay, I just don't want people to get lulled into some false security there because sure. I'm always talking about, okay, are you, how how well are you playing in time? What about the attack? What about the release of the notes? Yeah. What about, you know, it, don't don't tell me, oh, it's just one five, one five, it's no big deal. 
It is a big deal. If the song oh, calls yeah. for one five one five, give me the best one five one five you've got. Oh, so yeah. those little yeah. things, and and uh, I I'm, I know you agree with me there. I just thought it was worth saying for anybody. Oh, yeah. bass is easy. Yeah, it's only four strings. Oh, Jocko only yeah. needed. You know, that's, you know. No, no. Uh, it, it, well, well, that's funny as well because when I took up the bass guitar, I thought, oh, this is great. There's only four strings, and like, these days I play six and seven string basses. I'm thinking, what was I thinking of? You know why, why? Why make it so difficult? But um, but no, but it's like the old joke, isn't it? The, the the you must have heard the gag where the young kid he takes up the bass and he comes home and he and his dad said, "What did you learn today?" And he said, "Oh, I learned the notes on the E string." And so that's going to come great. The kid goes back the following week and he comes back and the dad says, "Oh, what did you learn today?" And the kid says, "Oh, I learned the notes on the A string." You know, the next week the kid doesn't go to his lesson and the dad says, "Well, well what, what's what's happened there? You know, why, why didn't you go to your lesson?" The kid said, "I got a gig." That's right. <laughs> Very true. I mean, it's you true, know. but it, you know, it's a joke. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, I just had to tell that gag because it's one. Of, it's one of my favorite gags. But no, you're absolutely right because the thing is, I mean, when we're play, playing the bass, that there's there's got to be as a bass player, you have you've got to have some gravitas there. You know, you've you've got to have a, a solidity about about yourself. You know, because the thing is, you know, I've seen great players with great facility. Uh, and, and they can do some stuff, but their timing is terrible. They 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 just haven't got that that in inbuilt time, you know. And it's really weird to see that the fact they they're doing all this soloistic stuff, but the the basic fundamental time is just not there, you know. And for me, if I go and see a gig and I'm I'm a, a, a punter in in the in the audience, a audience member, we call them punters, you know, paying paying public. Oh, okay. And if it's yes, another one for you, Punter, yeah. Um, well, that's the term the American bass... football. That... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I'm watching a bass player, the two really more than more than his soloing ability, more more than anything flashy, the two things that I that are most important for me when I'm listening to another bass player is his sound. I want to hear a good sound, especially from acoustic double bass. Yeah. I don't want to hear a thin, whiny sound i want to hear a big fat ray brown big big sound so that's key but then the next thing it, it's time there's there's got to be good time and obviously if i can add a third one i would say feel i would say feel you know the groove or the soul of it but really i want to hear a good sound and a good time because if a guy has got a lousy sound and his time is off you shouldn't actually be up there playing with other musicians you should you know if you've got bad time you know, you you really shouldn't be up there until you sorted that out. You know, and and I'm sure some guys have lost gigs because of that. You know, because their their timing hasn't been good. You know, so and that isn't something that's always inbuilt. You know, sometimes that that has to be developed. You know, which and for me, I mean, I used to use a metronome. I mean, I don't I don't do it so much these days. But when I was younger, I did used to use one. I, there's no question about it. The reason why I don't use one anymore is because most of my work is learning songs to play on TV or to play on tour. So I'm learning them from a, an existing recording, which is usually with fantastic musicians to begin with. So when I've done my charts and I'm playing along with it, I'm playing along with the record. I'm playing along with the recording with these great, session guys or these great classic count basie orchestras whatever you know so i can't i don't really you know use a metronome that much because i'm playing with the, with the recordings which are in the pocket you know um but yeah i i definitely did uh sort of a, a, earlier on you know but also it, it just came from lots of listening i just listened to tons of music whenever i could when i was on tour in the tour bus you just listen to classic bands like Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, Weather Report. Those are my two favorite bands. If I could have been a bass player in any two bands on the planet, it would have been either one of those. That would have been made me happy. You know? Not as though I was good enough, I'm hasten to add, but those were my favorites. You know? But if you listen to enough great music and great rhythm section players, you know, the, whether it's the Funk Brothers, you know, where it's the Muscle Shoals guys, all that stuff. If you listen to enough of that, that stuff is going to get into your soul. That's going to become ingrained in you, that sense of time and pulse, whatever, you know. And I think the trouble is a lot of a lot of 
players. You know, a lot of people don't listen enough. They're so fixed with practicing. They're so fixed with actually, you know, doing the arpeggios and scales. Sometimes they forget to actually listen, just listen to music, not, not necessarily playing along with it, but just listen to tons of music. You know, that's, that's what you need to do. That's what I did. Uh, you know, and that's why I, I'm able, on Jules' show, someone said, right, we need you to do a ska thing, funk, pop, jazz, blues, uh, you know, I don't hesitate with any, there's nothing that I would cut, oh my God, oh my God, because I've listened, listened intently for 45 years, you know, not just practice, but I've done a lot of listening. I've done transcriptions and I've done all the technical stuff. A, a, a friend of mine, he's a jazz guitarist and, and, and I, I, one of the first things he, he said to me with he, when he goes to his pupils, they came along to him for jazz guitar lessons. And he, and he said to them, he said, listen more than you play. You know, and at first of all, he said that, and I'm kind of thinking, well, yeah, but you've got to play. You've got to practice your instrument. You've physically got to do the work on it, you know. But it's not really what he meant. He, he, he just meant that people don't stop and listen enough, you know, because they're so, they're so intent of getting that scale right or getting that arpeggio, or getting that that lick, you know, that they actually kind of forget to, to put a record on at some point during the day. You know, they forget to listen and just let it wash over you and sink into your soul, you know. And it's, you know, it, it's it's true. I, and I've been like it myself, you know. So so for me, listening is, is still a big part of my of my daily, but it's weird because you, you think if you're listening, you think if you haven't got your instrument in your hand and you're not physically doing something and you're just listening to a recording, your mind plays tricks with you because it, it, it makes you think, uh, oh, you, you're not improving because you, you ha you're not physically doing something on your instrument. But we don't work like that. Human beings don't work like that. You know, I've learned so much from just from just listening and, and listening to the, the bass player, but listening to all the other instruments. And sometimes you have to do that away from your instrument, you know, and just, and, and that's obvious with me, I think that's where my sense of time came from. More than practicing with a metronome, it came from listening to those classic recordings of all those amazing musicians who had great time, great feel, but also doing gigs with great players as well. That's the other thing. You know, it, it's it's the age old thing. Always try and play with people who are better than you. Yes, that was not a problem for me when I first took it up because <laughs> I started started playing uh, upright. Well, I started playing electric when I was fifteen. I started playing upright when I was nineteen, and I got really into jazz. And trying to play jazz on the upright when you're brand new at it, I was constantly playing with people who were so much better. I don't know if it was a lot of fun for them, but it was an enormous <laughs> for me. It is, but, but sometimes it can be embarrassing, you know. And, and you, oh, yeah. can, you have to be prepared for that. <laughs> the famous Charlie Parker story when he's playing and he didn't know about different keys, and the, the drummer throws the cymbal yes, across the screen. That in, in the Clint Eastwood movie, right? Bird. Yeah, right? yeah, it's in Bird. Yeah, and I think that's a true story, you know. And I, I have always said that, for me, the lessons I've learned as a musician have, have often been under the most painful, excruciating circumstances. You know, when you turn up to a gig and you don't know the tune and you should know it or you could have learned it, just anything like that, you know. Um, you know I, I, but then you learn the lesson very quickly, you know. When you get caught out, yes. and I'm thinking to myself, no, this isn't going to happen again. Not just in music, but in life. In in life, absolutely, yeah. So being being prompt for things, you know, not being late and, and stuff like that, you know. But I, I was actually a very mediocre student at school. I've got no qualifications at all. I've got no academic qualification. I didn't even no, do... No letters after your name? Oh, God, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, well, pro pro probably not ones that we can say here on this program. Um, <laughs> But um, no, but seriously, I. But you know what? That and I didn't even take music at school. I didn't take music as an academic subject because when I chose my options of what I wanted to study, this was before I took up the trombone. So I didn't know I was going to be a musician. So I didn't pick music. It wasn't. It was crazy. I wish I had them. But really, it's a blessing and a curse because although I regret not having a great education and having no qualifications, it was when I left school was when my education started. Absolutely. But then I thought, I I want to, I start making up for lost time, you know, so now I'm the eternal student. I'm always studying, 
now. I mean, you know, I, I, I studied guitar. I took up guitar in lockdown as well. I wanted to do that for a long time. But I'm always kind of, I, I read a lot, you know, whether it's about music or philosophy or, or self-improvement, anything like that. I am the eternal student now. And it's kind of quite funny if some of my teachers, if they're still alive, if they could see me now, they'd, they'd probably kind of go, is this the same guy, you know? Because I was the kid in the back of the class saying, don't ask me, no, don't, you know. So I kind of think that what happened at school had a profound effect on me as an adult. And like now, I don't want to be caught out. I don't want to bluff anything, you know. I want to I want to do my homework, which I never did when I, you know, when I was in school and I was supposed to, like now. You know, I always do more than, than what's needed. If we play with someone on Jules' TV show and we get given a song to play, I will transcribe the version we're given, but I will then listen. I will find other versions, and I will transcribe those as well because there might be like a little nugget of something that the bass player did in another version, or there might be a nice chord change, you know. So I, I guess you could almost call it, you know, as an analogy, it's like, you know, the, the kid that gets the shiny apple he shines the apple to give to teacher, you, you know, to kind of curry favour. I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm not kind of doing all this work just so I can, you know, get acknowledged. I do it for me. I understand. You know, I do it for my, my own benefit, you know. That's and, great. And you it know, was, just really quickly, it was when, when we played with one of the, the best gigs I did on TV was playing with Paul Simon. <clears throat> this was, when was this? I think it, it was after we spoke. It, it, I can't remember what it was, maybe, I think it was the same year maybe, but later on, Paul Simon was coming on Jules' show. And we said, oh, we, you know, we need you on there to play upright bass. And I just thought this is going to be probably a quite a pedestrian bass part, you know, fairly sort of simple, nothing to it. And then um, and I got the track and it was a big bass feature. It was, the, whole thing. It was the song was called Wristband. Oh, yes. You know, and it was he had a new album at that time, and wristband was one of the tracks of it. You know, and I'm thinking, oh well, let's let's have a listen to this. You know, and I listened to it, and I thought, oh my, <laughs> you know, it was literally the song is just predominantly voice and double bass. It, it's almost like a duet. Who's on the record? Bagiti Kumalo? No, no. I tell you, I t well, I tell you who it is. It was Carlos. Forgive me, I can't remember the pronunciation of his surname. He plays with Branford Marsalis. Carlos Hen Henriquez. Oh yes, I think if it's who I'm thinking of, wasn't he with Winton Marcellus's big band? Is that oh, the guy? Yes. I the saw guy. him live. Yeah, with the big yes. band. Oh, okay, yes. that's 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 the guy. Because I also know him because we both use Parastro double bass strings, and he's got his own. He's got his own set. He's got his own custom set of Parastro. Anyways, I didn't know it at the time. I just got that one track. I didn't know who the bass player was. I knew it was on double bass. But it's a big double bass feature, so I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. So I get to the studio, and Jules is on piano, the drummer. We had a couple of horns. And like, and I go to put my double bass at the back of the room where I normally stand. You know, the tall guy, then the bass player, get at the back, you know. <laughs> and then and then Paul was there. Paul Paul's Simon's at the front. And then the, the producer and the director said, no, no, no. You've, you've got to stand at the front next to Paul. You're mm -hmm. right at the front of this. And I'm kind of going... And they said, well, because it's a it's a bass and voice feature. I'm thinking, <laughs> as if it wasn't pressure enough already. Did you have like, music in front of you or was it memory? No, no, no. Well, here's the thing. So I I learned, I transcribed the bass part. I transcribed it. But I, um, I, I learned it because it wasn't that difficult. But it was kind of quite unusual. There was a lot of offbeats. It was like very riff based. Um, and it was, in, it was an E flat. And I thought to myself, yeah. And the bass riff, okay, I couldn't find a decent fingering for this thing. I literally, because because the first two notes are the, are the E flat, uh, you know, that you play on the D string, the first fret equivalent on a double bass, and then you jump up the octave. So I had to find the E flat on the A string. Right, on the sixth string. It's a, quick, it's a quick jump, you know. And then the rest of it, and I'm work, I'm, I'm trying to do this fingering at home, and I'm thinking, oh, God, this doesn't feel good at all. This, I, you know, And I pride myself on working out really good logical fingerings. And I'm thinking, I can't find a good way to play this. So in the end, you just have to pick one. You have to pick the best of, the, best of a bad bunch, I think the saying goes, you know. And I thought, E-flat, man, E-flat, who's done this show? 
So anyways, uh, we, we're doing the, the warm-up for the, the rehearsal, and Paul's standing next to me. So he and I are chatting all, all afternoon. We're having a gas, you know. And, of course, it's quite funny with the height differential because, you know, I'm taller than average and he's probably shorter than average. Yeah. But what a lovely man. And he was telling me stories. His dad was a double bass player. He still has his father's double bass in his office. You know, he was asking about mine, where it was made, kind of thing. So anyway, we, we, we ran through it a few times. And the thing is, every time we ran it, he sang it slightly differently. And by that, I mean that he would jump bars. You know, so it was all, it was like, it was like a two bar riff almost like this, but then he would almost like miss a bar and then jump to the, you know, so I'm kind of going, oh, wow. You know, so this isn't just playing what's on the record. He's, he's kind of busking this. You know, he's he's making these little shifts. And I thought, I've got to go with this, you know, because you have to follow the singer. That's the key thing, isn't it? But I'm thinking, wow, every single time we did it, he did it differently. He he moved he moved the bars around like this. <clears throat> but I thought to myself, no, I, I, I'm prepared for this. You know, I'm a professional. I can do this. <clears throat> it's still a bit shocking, though, I've got to say. But anyway, we, we did the song and it all went well. And at the end of it, you know, he gives me a big handshake. You can see it on TV. It's on, it's on YouTube. Uh, if you put in like Jules Holland, Paul Simon wristband, you can see it. And he gave me this big handshake and it was great. And everyone saw it. And it's the first time I'd ever had a big double bass feature on TV, you know, and, and that was kind of cool, you know. And then I can't remember how long ago it was after that, you know, and, and it was online and someone was talking about that track and Carlos came came into the conversation you know and he introduced himself and said oh that was me on the on the original recording you know and i said oh great i said i wanted to do that i said beautiful playing said, i said it was a pleasure playing your line you know and i said but i've got to say carlos i said that key man i said i couldn't get a good frame i said e flat man he said it wasn't an e flat they said it, it was in d and paul had changed the speed of the tape. So, and I'm sitting there kind of going, what? And I immediately went to my double bass and I picked it up and I played that bass riff <clears throat> in D and I'm thinking... This is a lot easier. <laughs> straight away, you've got the open D string and the octave. Yeah. And then every... And you've got the open G... And I'm thinking, I knew there was something wrong here. He said, yeah, sorry, buddy. He said, you got the rough end of the stick. You know, he said, we did it in D in the studio. They changed the speed of the tape. So by the time you had to play it, it was an E flat. And I thought, oh, okay. Wow. And it all, it all became clear. And that's the reason why it was so, the fingering was really not very nice because it wasn't, Played but me, it like, came out a uh, lot stronger after that because well, exactly that. that, you know. But I'm kind of glad that I got to the bottom of it. I'm glad he he uh, he owned up and told me the truth, you know. So, but that was fun. That was fun playing with Paul because I, I grew up listening to him with my older brothers, you know. So, oh. to get to play with with someone that I that was the soundtrack to my life and yeah. my job. You it know, you remind me when when I was a kid, I never knew this till years later. But my turntable was was a half step off. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning all these rock tunes. I didn't think anything about it. I'm learning tunes in A flat and in E flat, and I, I, I it didn't strike me strange. I didn't even think about. It. I was just learning it in whatever key it was. Then I got into college. I got into the orchestra, and I'm playing along with Berlioz and Tchaikovsky and Beethoven. And, well, something's wrong here. And that's <laughs> how I found out that it was wrong because I don't think that the orchestra, you know, <laughs> transposed a, a half step down or a half step up or whatever it was. <laughs> So oh. that's how I realized it. But yeah, I'm playing like Peter Frampton in A flat. And I'm playing, you know, all these these classic rock tunes in E flat. And it was yeah, yeah. now I thought you were gonna say they tuned down, or you know, a lot of times they do that. I never wanted to do that if I played with a band and they tuned down. I said, no, I'm just gonna play it in whatever key you're playing with. I don't need to cheat, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and that's what's great about having good ears. I mean, when I moved, like I said, when I moved to London, I got the Jules gig. Prior to that, everything I did was I said reading music. So when I came to London, I made sure, I said to myself, I'm going to do everything that I haven't done before. I'm not going to repeat. So I, I did like cruise ships. I did a lot of work on cruise ships. That I is. did a lot of um, a pit work, you know, playing in, in, in musicals, which I loved. I loved all of this stuff. I but I thought too. to myself, I can do this and I've done it. 
you know, what I want to do now, I want to play with, uh, I want to play more improvised music. I want to play with improvising musicians. I want to do stuff where I'm using my ears more because that was where I, I lacked, you know, my strength was as a reader. I, my ears were not great, you know. So I deliberately, you know, took on, you know, I did jazz gigs. I took on gigs where I was forced to learn stuff on the bandstand. Yeah. You know, I was, I, I was, and the great thing is about, I always say it's good to have a bit of keyboard knowledge. Even if you're not a piano player, yes. it's good to have some knowledge of the keyboard because I was able on gigs when I didn't know the tunes, I was able to, to watch the keyboard player's hands yes. and see what he was doing in his left hand, see the chords. And I Especially was then left pinky, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. You know, now I know some people that, you know, they don't have any keyboard knowledge at all, you know, and I encourage them to get some because, and again, Jules on a gig, uh, can I stand in line with him? You know, he's facing sideways and I'm facing straight onto the audience. Sometimes he'll start doing a song we haven't played in 20 years. Yeah. He'll just play it out of the blue and he hasn't told us, you know. And usually my ears can pick it up within a couple of beats, but sometimes it's, it's still useful. I just watch his left hand. Yeah. I'm the closest to it. And just having that keyboard knowledge is a massive help, you know, to, to, to know where the song's going, you know. So I wish I could play piano. At the moment, my six-year-old is the best piano player in our house. There so go is. figure, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dave, this is awesome. I could go on geeking out on all kinds of music, <laughs> stuff, bass stuff all day, but uh, we, we have reached the end. But I, I do have one more question. I, I, don't, I, I watched the last video the other day, and I can't remember if I asked you this or not. So I will ask you my signature sign-off question. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, there's. I, I can tell you a couple really quickly. I, I, I'd love to be a, an archaeologist. I thought I always think archaeology is like really fascinating. I love that. I think you dig that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know. Where's the drummer? <laughs> yeah, hey, and um, but you know, we're, I, I'm, I'm a big horror movie fan. You know, I've always loved horror movies since I was a kid. I'm great friends with Sarah Karloff, who's the daughter of Boris. You know, so when I was a kid, I was obsessed with making myself up as a monster. You know, I was sticking bolts on my neck painting scars and stuff. So yeah, I wanted to be as a kid. My first thing was I wanted to be a horror makeup guy, you know, in, in movies. I really wanted to do that. But of course- Your parents must have been thrilled, right? So proud, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, a couple of things, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with the human brain. So I think I'd like to have done something in psychology as well, maybe, you know, psychoanalyst, that kind of thing, you know. But yeah, my, my childhood ones was ar ar archaeologist because I was always digging as a kid. I was always digging the garden, looking for something. I don't know what it was. Um, but yeah, you know, the horror makeup guy, we, we, that would have been pretty cool, you know. So I, there's a lot of guys that obviously are the best in the world, like Rick Baker and Dick Pierce and all these kind of guys. And I admired all the work they did on classic movies. And Jack Pierce, of course, who did the Universal films. So yeah, that that would have that would have probably been it really. But I I got I got caught with a music bug. That was it. It, it. it dug its claws in me and wouldn't let go. Not a bad thing to be caught by. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much, and uh, I look forward to our next meeting in person. I don't think we. I think we last time we saw each other was uh, was at that one of those Warwick base camps in Machnerkirch in Germany. Oh, so that was that after the the bass guitar show. Yeah, because yeah. the bass show was in March 2016 was when we did the last interview. So. Right, and the Warwick things were in yeah. uh, like uh, late August, early September. I went in 2014, 15, 16, and then they invited me back in 2019 when Roger oh, okay. and uh, aligned with, uh, sure. with the guys over there at Warwick. But anyway, great to catch up with you. And I, I can't believe, you know, the Oscar wasn't even a thought when we were... Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, no, he was he was nothing yet. So I was very glad to have met him briefly before we went on live with this interview. And uh, Lucy and your lovely family. And it's great catching up with you. And I look forward to seeing you, hopefully in person. But if not, we'll do a follow-up. It sounds like you're going to have a lot of things to talk about. So yeah. thanks so much, Dave. Much appreciated. My pleasure. My Anytime. pleasure. Anytime. You. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Leapman, founder and first baseman. If you've ever wanted to learn bass, you've got to check out, you've got to know that right now there are thousands of people 
all over the world coming to ForBassPlayersOnly.com in our whole big community. A lot of those people are over 50, and they are learning bass and having the time of their life playing the music that they love. Come join them and experience that incredible transformation for yourself. Because remember, you're never too old to groove, so let's play bass. Thanks again to my special guest, Dave Swift. I will see you all right here next week, same time, same place at ForBassPlayersOnly.com. In the meantime, let's play bass. 